Okay, so uh, we are beginning the first webinar, and this is an introduction to the methodology that we will be using for the Young Adult Ministry Symposium. Um, much of this comes from the uh, Christus Vivit, which is the document that resulted from the Synod on Young People, Faith, and Vocational Discernment. And I'm very excited to have Brenda with us. Brenda Noriega is a young minister committed to accompaniment and evangelization. She earned a master's degree in pastoral ministries from the University of Santa Clara. Brenda collaborates in multiple national and international committees, including the International Youth Consultative Body for the Dicastery of Laity and Family Life in Rome, which you'll hear more about. In her current professional role as mission educator promoter with Mary Noel Fathers and Brothers, Brenda forms and accompanies young people and their families, developing their leadership skills to become missionary disciples, practicing their Christian values in their daily life. Welcome, Brenda. Thank you, Casey. Um, it is a pleasure really for me to be here and just breaking breath with you guys and sharing my experience of Christus Vivid and my experience of the Synod process. I'm gonna start sharing my screen, but first of all, I want to invite you um, to make this a dialogue. I think one of the benefits of having a small group is that we can actually be a community and we can just like have a conversation and be in this fraternity, right? As Christians and just share what is in our hearts and also in our minds and our thoughts and opinions about the presentation. So I'm gonna um, invite you to use the chat box for any comments you want to, or questions you want to put throughout the, uh, the presentation. Hi, Casey Husband. Hello, he's right there in the corner. We can see you. <laughs> welcome, you're welcome. Um, great, so let's start. And seriously, if there's something you don't understand, because I do have a beautiful accent and I am aware of it. So if you, there's something you don't understand, either uh, a word or I don't say something correctly, because that happens often, just ask in the chat box, I don't get offended at all. So um, let's start our presentation with Christos Vivid. I am very excited to talk about this document. It has really changed the way I see ministry with young people, but also a reminder of of me being a young person in the church, what does that mean for me as a young person in the church? And a reminder that, that I am not, I should not be waiting for others to give me permission to share the gospel or the good news, right? That that's already a baptismal call. And, and so that was, that, that's exactly what Christus Vivid has been for me. So the translation, of Christus Vivid into English has been Christ is alive. And as you see, there is the exclamation mark right here because it is really like Christ is alive, right? Um, and with it, like so much happiness and joy. So Christus Vivid, it is a postinodal apostolic exhortation. So what does that mean? Um, it means that it's the fruit of a synod process. And what synod is in the tradition of the church, it has been, this was the 15th general assembly of the bishops. So the bishops in the, from different parts of the world uh, come together and they have a dialogue about different topics. And in this case, they had in 2018, they had the discussion on the young people, the faith and vocational discernment, and that was the, the title. So each pope decides the title or the theme for the synod process. And in this idea of the synod is not only a listening, but um, I get so excited because because the, the synod on young people or the synod on youth change history, okay? It really changed history in the Catholic Church. Um, let me start with a little bit of a timeline right here, and I'm not gonna talk about all of it, but Pope Francis didn't wake up one day and said, 
oh, now let's talk about drunk people, right? Or, you know what, let me start writing about drunk people, and then the document came out. No. So he has been listening to drunk people um, always, really, but when it comes to his papacy, he has been listening to drunk people through World Youth Day. So we have World Youth Day Brazil, World Youth Day Poland, World Youth Day uh, Panama. He has also been listening about young people, not only to young people, but about young people through the synod of the families, the two synod of, uh, on the families. And the families were, kept talking about their concern about their children and their young people in their communities. And so Pope Francis kept listening. And in 2016, he announces the synodal process. That's when he says, you know what? It's time to talk about young people. We're going to spend time talking just about young people. But here is when he comes and changes history. He says, we are not only coming as bishops to Rome to just talk about them. This is the process. And he announces the process. And in this process, he says, we're going to do a consultation to the entire world. Why want to hear about all young people in the world? And so... This consultation had not been done in other processes before in the Synod. Um, and it was not an intentional listening to young Catholics only, but also to non-Catholics. He really wanted to hear from everybody. So every um, Episcopal conference in the world had to compile these responses. There were two ways. One, it was the diocese, the parishes and the Episcopal conferences listening and, and the process of listening to specific questions. And there was also a link to a survey from the Vatican. So young people were able to send their responses directly to the Vatican or also to their Episcopal conferences. And so the Episcopal conferences gather the information, compile it, summarize it, and send it to Rome. Then the next step that marked history, that really changed the history of CNET, was that the young people in 2000, um, so in 2017, we have the international survey, but then we have the pre-synodal uh, meeting, and it is with 300 young people in Rome, okay? Pope Francis says, let's listen to young people before we bring the, the bishops, let's listen to young people. And so 300 young people are invited to Rome and they talk about their needs, their challenges. They also go through the survey answers and they, they help to create the working document. So what is the working document? The working document is pretty much the framework for the conversation of the Synod. One of the people that was instrumental creating the working document was actually, uh, or contributing to the working document was Katie Prejean. And as you know, she is from the United States. Uh, so we are very proud to, to say that Katie was part of, of the country or those who contributed to the working document. So then the young people uh, write their thoughts, their challenges, their experiences, everything, and then they give that document to the bishops. So if that was not enough, for the young people to be part of the process, uh, they are invited to be, um, to be, oh my gosh, what is the name they gave them? I forget the name, but to be like secretariats pretty much, right? Like secretaries during the CNAT process. And that happened in October of 20, 2018. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I forgot the, the term. So anyways, I just gotta move on because my brain is bogging me. Advisors? No. The what? Advisors? Is no. That, okay. Another um, one. That's okay. Ah, okay. It's fine. It's going to come up. Before we leave, I'm going to give it to you guys. But they are invited to auditors, to be auditors of the CNAP process. So all the CNAP process, they always have auditors. And, um, and they pretty much help the conversation to move, right? They pass out the papers uh, to the bishops or the CNAP fathers. That will be the, the name of the bishops who are selected from their countries, uh, the, the Synod Fathers. And so they choose young people from different parts of the world to walk with the Synod Fathers through the process. And these young people, um, I have the opportunity to talk to them and, and just like to get the inside stories that we're not gonna find in documents and books. 
And they say that it was a little bit difficult at the beginning because the young people didn't exactly know how to approach the bishops. And the bishops also didn't know exactly how to approach them. But throughout a month sharing together, because they will have meals together, okay? Um, throughout a month, working together, walking together, which is synod, right? Uh, synodality, walking together, they become close to each other uh, to the point that at the end of the synod, they ended up dancing on the street, celebrating that they were able to have conversations. In the synod, during the synod process, young people were invited to give witness of their experiences. And it was not only Catholic young people, these were non-Catholic young people as, as well coming and saying, this is how the Catholic church can come and serve us. This is how the Catholic church can give us hope, right? Because um, that's exactly what Pope Francis wanted through the process. Young people tell us, how can we renew ourselves? Uh, and I think that's beautiful because as a young adult myself and working with other young adults, what I often hear from young people is that the church is old and is not relevant and the church is not willing to change. But the process of the synod on young people really shows us that that's not the case, that the church is willing to listen and that the church is open to listen to us and be there for us, but also to give us a space uh, to express our concerns and our challenges and our voice. So, um, so then after that, we have Pope Francis in March of 2019, he signs the document which is pretty much what I have right here in my hands. And it's uh, totally free online as well. And so he signs a document, then is released on April to the entire world. And Pope Francis says, you know what? This is not enough listening, right? It has been beautiful. We have now a document, but I now want to hear from the young people themselves what the document has been for them and how the document is being received in the different countries. Um, and so they have a youth, a post-synodal youth forum. And I was part of the, of the post-synodal youth forum representing the United States um, with my friend Brian Rood. The two of us went to Rome and talk about the document and talk about what the young people in the United States were saying about the document, but also our a strategy as a country um, to help young people, right? To learn about the document, but also to change the structures because that's part of it. It's not just having young people reading the document. So anyways, so this is how Christus Vivid came to be, right? It was not suddenly Pope Francis getting up one morning and started writing. Um, in the document, the document, uh, like I said, it was an, an intentional listening before the CNET, during the CNET, and after the CNET. As I'm telling you, you see Pope Francis being so close to the people. And th that was the experience of um, auditors. These are some of the auditors. This is actually a picture from the press CNET, what I'm showing right here. And this is a, a CNET, a picture from uh, the Senate process. Uh, this one right here is Jonathan Lewis, who represented the United States. Um, and so here you see like the young people with the Senate fathers, and you see the young people being so close to the bishops, you know, and, and to Pope Francis. And that's exactly what the type of church Pope Francis wants to see, you know, a church where we all walk together where we all um, just serve those who are vulnerable and, and that we bring Christ together. And this is, when you see the pictures, it's like this was the Sinat process, um, a journeying together. And then after the Sinat, the conversation continued, not only at the post synodal meeting, this is a picture from the post synod, and that's me giving my three minutes of um, of my brain <laughs> to the entire uh, group. Um, and then this is like 250 young people. But throughout the CNAT process, the young people ask to continue the conversation, to continue the dialogue with Rome. And they said, we don't want this to end 
at the end of this month. And the bishops or the fathers, right, the Synod fathers, they wrote it down on the final document and they said, we propose an international committee um, to continue the dialogue with Rome. And so in November of, 2000, of 2019, November 24, 2019, it's announced the youth, the first international youth advisory committee, the first one ever. And it's the pictures right here, 20 of us were chosen and I'm one among the 20. Um, so Rome chooses 20 people and just to continue dialogue. So we've been meeting since February of this year, just listening to each other and talking about how we can continue this journey of being Christians in such a challenging world today. How can we continue sharing the gospel and sharing the good news when there is a lot of um, reasons to feel down sometimes? And so the scene that process is not over, right? And we have Christus Vivid. In Christus Vivid, we have the structure. It has nine chapters. Um, it is written to the entire church. It's directed to or addressed to the entire church. It has an emphasis on young people, definitely, but it is not only for young people. In fact, when you read Christus Vivid, it's like being in a round table. It's like Pope Francis being at the center and, and him looking like to young people at one point, and then he looks to the other side, talking to the elderly or to those who are older, and then looking to everyone. And, and so you have this dialogue in, throughout the document of the Holy Father with young people and with those who serve and accompany young people. It is a very casual language, very casual language to the point that Pope Francis includes poems from Argentinian and uh, Argentinian poems. And so it's, it's just like reading a love letter from a grandpa, to be honest, that's how I feel. I'm like, this is Pope Francis being so close to us that he gives us such an easy language. It's not a body canized language, right? It's very easy to understand. And he shares his own experiences, even as a Pope. He, at one point he says, when I became a Pope, it was a renewal for me as well. And so he is vulnerable, sharing his own challenges as well. Um, he includes voices of young people. He quotes young people who are part of the CNAT process. Um, that's amazing. Like, when have you seen that before in other documents for reals? Like, the voices of young people, just like that here. The young people can also teach us, right? They are not only listening, but the young people give as they receive. Um, and we see a methodology of to see, to judge, and act, or instead of judge, it will be discerned. And that is a very Latin American methodology in which the see part is um, the analysis of the reality. And so you find that uh, first he opens chapter four, one and chapter two, uh, talking about the young people in the scriptures, but then he moves also to talk about young people nowadays, today, the realities of young people today. And that is the C part, right? Analysis of the reality. Then he moves into the discernment of what are these challenges? So what are the challenges or the reality that we have observed in light of the scriptures. And so he comes with chapter four, giving us what I call the chapter of hope, because it's a, it's a beautiful chapter where, where he just gives us so much hope to keep hoping, to keep moving, to keep loving, to keep sharing God's love. Um, and then we go into the act part, and also in the, in the act part, then we see like chapter five, six, seven, eight, and nine, where it's more of a, how are we to move forward, right? Once we know the realities, once we know that Christ is there for us, that Christ is alive and that he wants us fully alive, then what now what? And so he says, young people, you have to like move forward as well. You have to be protagonist. But then he talks to the older people <laughs> who are to accompany young people and he tells them, hey, young people, you're not supposed to move alone. Um, you're not supposed to move forward just on your own. You, you have to be rooted and rooted in Christ, but be also rooted in your traditions and be proud of where you come from. 
Um, and he tells the elderly, like, we have to move forward together. And so he includes, in, at the end of chapter six, he includes this um, analogy of a young person through the synod uh, to describe the church. He says, the church is like a canoe in which the elderly, um, the elder, elderly are the ones with the wisdom who know how to read the signs and are reading the stars, right? And the young people are the ones who are taking to the oars and they are like pushing forward. And so it's both of us together in the canoe. And so that is the church. Young people and old people, <laughs> I always get in trouble when I say like old people, but young people and those who accompany young people together in the canoe moving forward. And that's the church and that's synodality, all of us moving forward. Another, um, and so another thing he says on terms of the act and moving forward, and he tells about this accompaniment, but he also says that the young people are the ones who serve young people. We are the ones who know how to, how to communicate the message of the gospel in our own language as, as we are, right, as young, as young adults. And right now we have all young adults um, present here. So I'm just going to mention young adults. And the document says youth many times, but every time the document says youth, it actually refers to young people, meaning youth and young adults. Um, the ages for the CNET process were 16 to 30. Or, um, in the United States, the age for young adults goes all the way to 39. And he does specify, Pope Francis does specify in the document that each country is different. And so we have to adapt the document to our own reality. So if we have young adults who are over 30, yes, the document is for them too. Um, good, and the, uh, let's move forward. So Pope Francis in this message of hope and love, um, he says right almost at the end of chapter one, he comes and he says, if you have lost your inner vitality, your dreams, your enthusiasm, your optimism and your generosity, Jesus stands before you as once he stood before the dead son of the widow. And with all the power of his resurrection, he urges you, young men, I say to you, arise, right? And you see this language throughout the entire document. Pope Francis communicating to the young people, arise, move, don't stay in the couch. Don't be parked cars, he says, don't be parked cars. Do not observe the world from, from the balcony. And, and so it's this message of young people, you need to move and you cannot be isolated. That's another message he says, like you cannot be isolated. And so it's this hope of young people contributing to the entire world. And how can we do that? Well, he comes in 132 and he says, are you looking for a passion? You know, fall in love. And when you fall in love, Whatever you love, it's exactly what's going to decide. It will decide what will get you out of bed in the morning. What you do with your evenings, how you spend your weekends, what you read, whom you know, what breaks your heart, and what amazes you with joy and gratitude. So he comes and, and, and gives us this, not only the hope and the urgency, but he says, how are you going to feel empowered to do something only if you fall in love with whatever you fall in love is what is going to move you. Like I was telling you in chapter four and how, and how we fall in love and what we love. Um, he comes in chapter four and he gives us these beautiful words from the scriptures that give us a message of how much God loves, loves us. So I'm going to invite you to just like close your eyes right there where you are, close your eyes and listen to these words that are the same words we find in the scriptures. It says in God's word, we find many expressions of his love. It is as if he tried to find different ways of showing that love so that with one of them, at least he could touch your heart. And these are the words our Heavenly Father tells us. I led them with cords of compassion, with bonds, with bands of love. 
I, I was to them like those who leave infants to their chicks. Can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. For the mountains may depart and the hills be shaken, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be shaken. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. For you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. The Lord, your God, is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. He will renew you in his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. And I invite you to open your, your heart, I mean, your, your eyes. And just think about this. And I want to invite you to write on the chat really quick. What comes to your mind and to your heart as you heard these words? Which is the, the same as scripture, right? And this is what Paul Francis is trying to communicate, like, fall in love. When I read, this, when I read these words, I was crying because there is no way not to fall in love with these words. There is no way not to fall in love when you, with God when you realize how much he loves you. Um, and as a person that has suffered so, so much in relationships, for me to know that God loves me recklessly, like nobody else will ever love me, it really moves me and gets me out of bed, right? And so that's exactly what Paul Francis wants to remind us. We also see Christus vivid, a, a strong communication of young people as part of a synodal process. A, a listening and moving together. And he says, youth ministry has to be synodal. Um, it's actually ministry with young people. So that includes, that includes the, um, the young adults. And in the Spanish, it doesn't only say has to be synodal, but it says must to be synodal. So there is no other way for young ministry to be, but in synodality. Um, so I'm going to pass here because we have a very a special person joining us. So Casey, who do we have with us? And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so you, you see him. Thank you, uh, Brenda. Um, I'm going to the uh, Archbishop Brolio. Good evening, Your Excellency. Um, it's currently mute. So You're just yes. muted, yeah. Yeah. I can ask you. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hey. Oh, you got it. Yeah, I did. Thank you very much. How's everyone this evening? Sorry, I'm a little bit late. We had a little minor dilemma here. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you for uh, joining us uh, today um, or this evening, Archbishop. Um, I'm, I'm, it sounds like or it looks like everyone's familiar. Um, Archbishop is our shepherd uh, for the Archdiocese for the Military Services. Um, and Brenda was just um, sharing a presentation on Christus Vivi with us. All right. Well, if she wants to continue, uh, I don't have to interrupt. I can listen. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Archbishop. I'm excited. I, I really love bishops, and, and so it's great to have you here, Archbishop. Thank you so much. And it's just, everything is better when we have our shepherds walking with us, right? It's just, thank you. <laughs> so, um, so yes, so young people have to be part of a process of synodality and meaning once again, a walking together. And when it comes to synodality, Pope Francis, right on chapter two, he gives us this image of the caravan. And, and so he talks about how in the caravan and the, the New Testament, we see Jesus walking with the entire community. Uh, with his parents and, and, and also the neighbors and everybody walking together. And so he tells us very much that modality is going in a caravan and all of us being part of the same caravan. So moving forward, because I'm past my time. So 
Jung people as protagonists, he also says very strongly, he says, dear Jung people, my joyful hope is to see you keep running the race before you. May the Holy Spirit urge you, urge you on as you run this race. The church needs your momentum, your intuitions, your faith. We need them, right? We need them. Um, the church needs who we are and what we have to offer. And, and I think having this words coming from the Holy Father, from the vicar of Christ, it gives me hope as a young person. And it also gives me the motivation to do something, right? And, and to be part of a church and to be active and to not shine away um, and to not hide what I, my, my mind and my, my talents and my gifts, but to be comfortable offering um, to the community and, and to my group, my small group and, and whatever I move to offer what God has put in me. And I think this is the invitation to every single one of us right? It's not just for one. It is for every single one of us to recognize the gifts that the Holy Spirit has already bestowed in us and also um, to just put them into action. So, but he says the, the great question, and I love it because on when he, Pope Francis talks about vocation and discernment, he says the question, um, and I'm just going to read the quote because it's, it's very powerful in my opinion. Uh, it says so often in life, we waste time asking ourselves, who am I? You can keep asking, who am I? For the rest of your lives. But the real question is, for whom am I? And so wherever we go, right? Wherever we move, whatever we are, um, we always need to know that we are, and he says, of course you are for Christ, but you are also for others. So the main question is for whom God created me to, to be? Is it for children? Is it for the safety of people? Is it for, um, for health care? Is it like, and then once we discern the area, the people that we are to serve, then we can look like in what ways we do it, right? Um, so this question of for whom am I, it's really a question of discernment. And, and it's a great question for, throughout Christos Vivid, giving us this light of hope, a light of love, a life of encouragement, a life of synodality, which is a caravan in we, where we listen to each other, uh, where we share and appreciate the talents of every person. Here, when it comes to synodality, it says, motivated by this spirit, we can move towards a participatory and corresponsible church. That is synodality participatory and co-responsible church, one capable of appreciating its own rich variety, gratefully accepting the contributions of the lay faithful, including young people and women, consecrated persons, as well as groups, associations, and movements. And I am so happy that, um, that you guys are now starting this process of, of listening and intentional listening, re, uh, recognizing each other's gifts, in realities and recognizing that the co-responsibility of being church, right? And being part of the church. Uh, if you have any more questions, I'm, I'm gonna stay with you the rest of our time together. But if you have any additional questions, feel free to DM me through um, Instagram. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you so much for sharing that. I appreciate that. Um, and uh, as Brenda mentioned, uh, really, our invitation, our invitation here is to um, invite you to be that protagonist um, in young adult ministry. And uh, with that, um, we actually have a military young adult with us um, who has been a part of that. Um, and I'm going to share a, a brief bio on Katie, and then I will give the floor to Katie. So Katie Taylor is an Air Force veteran and an Air Force Academy graduate. She currently lives in Phoenix, Arizona with her three children and her husband, Drew, who is an active duty pilot stationed at Luke Air Force Base. They are passionate about equipping and training Christian leaders in the new evangelization through living awesome Catholic lives. While living at remote and overseas bases, locations, uh, excuse me, overseas base locations, Katie took opportunities to serve her chapels 
as RCIA director, an RE teacher, NFP instructor, Pietra fitness instructor, retreat director, small group leader, and spiritual coach. Katie and Drew currently are Catholic writers and speakers working on producing video resources for Catholic Link English's YouTube channel. So without further ado, uh, Katie, please go ahead. Thank you, Casey. I, yes, so I had the opportunity to be involved in some of the national dialogue. So I attended the uh, Voice and Vision, which was a conference to bring the U.S. conversation uh, to ministries of youth and young adults. Uh, so in that, I, when Casey said that I was going to get to go, I then read uh, Christine's Amendment and got to reflect on this document. And so it definitely is a uh, powerful and inspiring letter to us and to the Church Universal. Uh, the thing that stuck out to me was that this conversation was happening. Uh, that our church was seen on a universal, national, and local level, that the pews were missing this age range. This, whether you started at 12 to 30 or 18 to 39, uh, demographic was not there. And so that was actually affirming to me that there was a desire for change. And so a lot of what Pope Francis is speaking to is not this change for doctrine or church teaching, but innovative solutions to engage, to evangelize, to reach the hearts and minds of this demographic. And so as you know, uh, your peers aren't all there and you are the exception. Uh, and so thank you for being here tonight and to have this conversation. Um, when we look at that change, uh, Pope Francis quoted in the document, this idea of, uh, by St. Paul VI, that our youth is restlessness. Uh, and this restlessness is a, it generates a boldness to stand up and to take responsibility in the mission. And so this restlessness is not one uh, we really want in these conversations through this summit is not uh, the negativity or the like frustration, but this restlessness to create actionable solutions, to have the conversation and see what's been working well and what uh, kind of isn't. And so I really, when I read the document, uh, Brenda pulled out so many quotes that I love from this letter. Uh, the idea that in 20, if you've lost that inner vitality, that your dreams, your enthusiasm, your optimism, your generosity that Christ stands before you and urges you to arise, I think that in the military, we can be really good at being cynical. Uh, and I, I think like as an Air Force Academy cadet, like that was something we prided on ourselves on was how cynical and negative we could be in situations. And so to look at this and go, you know, in 19, he talks about, we can spend our youth being distracted, skimming the surface of life, half asleep, incapable of cultivating meaningful relationships or experiencing the deeper things in life. But that's not how we want to be. And so kind of this idea that uh, usefulness is not just a age range, but a mentality. And we want to look at Christ and be arised in our usefulness to give to the church. Because honestly, it needs that boldness. It needs us stepping in for the mission. And so for me to see that conversation uh, happening to have the ability to witness this national dialogue that's looking at young adults and going, how do we uh, reach, serve, empower, and encourage? Uh, and that aspect, I think in this synod for the AMS, as we progress through these webinars and then eventually meet in person, hopefully next year, uh, this concept of these ideas to humble ourselves, to listen. Uh, I don't want to be written off because I'm 20 and we shouldn't also necessarily write off those who are 60, but this idea of coming together and learning from the other to have that dialogue. So much of our culture has lost that capacity. And so to see our church model that and to be models of that uh, is incredibly important. 
So I look forward to what you have uh, been using, what you've seen work in your military chapels as we kind of dive in to this conversation over especially the next couple webinars. Um, I think Brenda did a fabulous job of highlighting how important it is, the love that we have for Christ uh, and what we love will get us out of bed and will motivate us. Uh, Pope Francis also highlights in uh, 132 this idea, uh, it goes on further. Oh, 155, 132 is what we love will get us out of bed. But 155 is the idea that prayer is both a challenge and an adventure. And so as we dive into that adventure with Christ, uh, that that's the root of what empowers us as young adults. Uh, going forward to say in 142 that our anxiety can often get in the way uh, when we don't see instant results. And so right now there's only eight, nine of us uh, on this call. And the idea that when we don't see the instant results of seeing 500 young adults join in and want to be a part of this conversation, not allowing that to shut us down, but to inspire and empower us to fill that gap, to fill that need, uh, and to challenge our peers through that. Um, with that, I will turn it over to discussion because I know that we are running a little long and I just want to thank you uh, for having this opportunity to share a little bit about what this letter meant to me. I guess my last point I will say is I encourage each of you to read it if you haven't. Um, one of the things that I really walked away with was a quote in the very beginning that this is our halftime prep talk, pep talk. Uh, this is to inspire us and to help us go forward. This isn't the end of a document, but the beginning of something uh, generating within our church. Uh, and so let it be something that helps inspire you that your, your Pope, the Vicar of Christ loves you uh, and wants wants so much uh, for this church and beauty in that. And Brenda just sent it out via the link so you can get it for free or you can buy one of the hard copy books that I like to read out of. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. Um, yeah, um, Brenda and Katie, thank you very much for uh, sharing both of your points of view on this. Um, so as Katie mentioned, uh, there is a hard copy Brenda shared the uh, free version, electronic version, um, and it'll be later, uh, probably in January, but um, if you are available for the in-person gathering, the symposium, we will be sending a copy of Chris's VV to our participants. So I hope that I get a chance to send that to you or one of my colleagues, but if not, I certainly uh, definitely grab that free version online. So I'm gonna pause the recording.